let's talk about the fundamentals of the market. And to help us with that, let me introduce our first speaker. She is not a stranger to us. She was ranked the best strategist by the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines in its most recent survey. And she has her own show at ANC every Tuesday evening. So look out for that. So to, to talk about the fundamentals of the market, let's all welcome COL's Vice President and Chief Equity Strategist, Ms. April Lee Tan. April. Thank you for that introduction, Marvin. So let me just start sharing my presentation. Okay, so, you know, I'd like to start out by saying that, you know, I'm not going to be um, you know, super optimistic about our economy because it's not, it's not really optimistic. As you can see, our economy is recovering at the slowest pace compared to other economies in the region. You can see that compared to other ASEAN countries, um, our GDP contraction was actually the sharpest during the first nine months of 2020. Um, and you can actually see that, for example, Vietnam is already uh, has consistently grown. And this is uh, quite unfortunate considering that we entered the pandemic uh, with a very strong position. Nevertheless, we are not performing the best. Um, economic growth has been quite weak. And for this year, although we are expecting a recovery, we're not expecting it to be uh, quite substantial or significant. And there are many reasons why. First is consumer and businesses are not expe expected to spend a lot. Their spending is expected to remain weak. Um, as you can see, Consumer confidence is still uh, very much low. And the number of employed Filipinos is still substantial. So during the start of 2020, the number of employed Filipinos is at around 42 million. Now we're down to around 30 million. So you have a lot of Filipinos who still don't have jobs. And what is uh, very sad is you will notice after increasing substantially when the government stopped the ECQ and we shifted to GCQ, you see after the latest data, a lot of employers actually still laid off people. So there are less employed Filipinos when in fact on a quarter and quarter basis, you would expect more businesses to employ more people because the economy reopened up some more. Okay. And next is, of course, the business confidence index, which is also still very, very weak at this stage. So if business confidence, it means that businesses will not spend on capital expenditures. And when the BSP did the survey for business confidence, the constraints that were highlighted by the businesses include the COVID-19 pandemic, and they said very weak demand, and they said competition remains substantial. And finally, uh, financial problems that they're encountering. Now, compared to previous surveys, it's important to note that uh, aside from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, more respondents said that they were suffering from insufficient demand. Yung competition actually nabawasan. Because of course, maybe more businesses are closing right now. That's why there's less competition. But nevertheless, they still highlighted it as a factor, um, as a business constraint. And of course, financial problems. In the past, they never really highlighted this. But now, they are highlighting financial problems as an issue. And um, the manufacturing PMI uh, is still at 49.2. So bakit ko hina-highlight ang manufacturing PMI? So purchasing managers index, okay? Um, so how do you read the PMI first? The PMI has to be above 50 to indicate that the manufacturing sector is actually expanding. But in our case, based on the December number, it's still below 50. And the reason why I highlighted this is because 
if you look at the other Asian countries, the manufacturing PMI is already above 50. Okay, and then according to the analyst who did the survey from IHS Market, uh, these are the factors that, you know, we're talking about during the survey. The Philippines continue to suffer from weak local demand. Uh, the businesses highlighted lockdown restrictions and poor weather conditions as factors that uh, negatively affect the demand. And they also suffered from material shortages and supply chain pressures. And most notable for me is that these businesses talked about sharp job cuts. So they continued to lay off people in December, um, either because of the weak demand and, you know, they needed to find ways to cut costs um, in light of the weak demand locally. And aside from that, some people just quit their jobs because they found it hard to uh, go to work. But the point is, Compared to other Asian countries, the reason why maybe we're not performing as strong as they are is, you know, they're more export dependent. We know that other Asian countries are very export dependent, whereas we are very um, domestically driven. So 70% of our GDP is actually consumer demand. So most likely the local manufacturers are catering to local demand. So since local demand is weak, therefore, you know, they, they are not recovering as fast as other countries. And although the BSP has been um, very aggressive in uh, loosening its monetary policy, which is supposed to drive economic growth, this is not driving economic growth because as you can see, uh, total bank loans, uh, the growth of total bank loans is actually slowing down substantially and the latest figure is 0.5%. You know, uh, in the past, this number was in the teens, no? So it's really quite slow. Uh, the lower rates are not translating to higher lending. And uh, as far as uh, the government is concerned, uh, aside from being quite conservative in the stimulus program, the CREATE law, which a lot of businesses are looking forward to, um, continues to face delays, okay? So what is the CREATE law? The CREATE law is the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives Reform Act. And the main, uh, the main provision as far as businesses are concerned is the reduction in the corporate income tax from 30% to 25% immediately starting July of last year and 1% um, reduction per year starting 2022 until it goes down to 20% by 2027. And if you're a small business, you immediately enjoy a 20% uh, corporate income tax down from 30%, no? An extension of uh, existing incentives for businesses, okay? And the reason why this is delayed is because the House of Representatives wants to hold a bicameral conference committee on the measure instead of adopting the Senate version. So hopefully it will only take a few months rather than being completely delayed for this year. No? Anyway, aside from the lackluster economic outlook of the Philippines, the PSEI's valuation is no longer attractive. So I'm sure you're now familiar with the PE band of the PSEI, which I always share every time I do a presentation. And um, as you can see here, you know, during the start of the crisis, we fell way below 15 times PE. But right now, um, we are at the upper end of the range. Um, you know, when we did the PE ratios, we're we're trading at around 20 times PE, which is quite high, as you can see historically. Because on the average, during the past 10 years, we traded at around 18 times PE. And we're now at 20 times, which is expensive, no? So, I mean, notwithstanding all those bearish factors about the economy and valuations, um, you know, I thought hard about this. But I believe that the market can and will still go up. And I will share with you the reasons why and the reasons why I think the positive factors will more than offset the negative ones. First is the availability of the vaccine, which will allow the economic recovery to, to pick up steam. Okay, so my feeling is 
yes, we're having problems right now, but once the country successfully vaccinates enough Filipinos, we'll see an acceleration of the economy economic recovery as Filipinos become more confident of going out and spending money. Okay, next, the valuations. Yes, I admit that stocks are expensive, but relative to bonds, we are actually still cheap, and I will discuss the reason why later. And finally, right now, there's an ongoing rotation into emerging markets, and the Philippines being part of that emerging market bas basket should benefit from this ongoing rotation. Okay, so I just like to share with you the status of the ongoing vaccine procurement by the government. So despite initial delays, actually, the government is uh, doing a good job. I mean, not bad. So in January, the first two weeks, we actually saw a lot of news flows as far as the vaccine procurement is concerned. So I think to all in all, they were able to uh, to sign a total of 70 million doses of vaccines from AstraZeneca, Sinovac, and uh, the SII Novavax. Okay, so that would be, that would allow the government to vaccinate around 35 million Filipinos at least. And then of course, there are talks that the private sector is in discussions with AstraZeneca um, to order another 3.7 to 3.8 million doses. Well, there are, I think the, the latest is um, the private sector is um, in talks with Moderna and we will have an idea as to whether or not uh, they will be able to secure the 20 million doses of Moderna within the week. So it's quite exciting because initially the government was only targeting maybe vaccinating 30 million Filipinos, but now they're talking about vaccinating um, 70 million Filipinos. So ordering a total of 148 million doses. And if they succeed in doing this, uh, we will be able to vaccinate um, more than 70% of the population. And that's enough to reach herd immunity which is very exciting because if we have herd immunity, then people will have more confidence going out and uh, we will see conditions returning to normal sooner rather than later. And do we have funds? Well, initially the concern was we don't have funds because the budget is only 2.5 billion under the DOH, no, under the 2021 budget allocation. Uh, but if we add the Bayanihan 2 funds that were not utilized, that's 10 billion, and unprogrammed funds um, from multi multilateral and bilateral uh, lending agencies and you know plans to borrow um, once these uh, contracts are secured, then we actually have enough, 82 billion pesos. So just to put things into context, if we look at the vaccines, the I think the AstraZeneca vaccines are only $5 per dose, so very cheap. Same goes for um, the SII Novavax, that's also around that price point. Sinovac, well, they're saying it's around 600 pesos or $13, no? So the, the, the expensive one is the Moderna and the Pfizer, but I don't think we're getting a lot of that, no? I think Gam Gamaleya from Russia is also very cheap, around the $5 range also. Okay, PSEI, yes, were expensive in terms of PEs compared to historical average, but if we compare it to bonds, we are actually still cheap. So this is the earnings yield less the 10-year bond yield. Now, although the PE ratio of stocks or the index is high, if we compare it to where the 10-year bond rate is right now, which is 3%, you still have a spread of around 2%. And historically, during the past 10 years, the average was 0.9%. So compared to bonds, it's still much more attractive to invest in stocks. Uh, Mohammed El Arin actually uh, called this Tina. There is no alternative because buying stocks is actually more attractive than buying bonds. Because if you buy bonds right now, and interest rates go up because you know uh, interest rates on bonds are at historic lows. 
uh, you run the risk of first getting locked in at a very low rate of only say 3% for 10 for the next 10 years. And aside from that, if you want to sell your bonds right now, you will suffer from um, capital losses. Whereas stocks, although interest rates could go up, uh, there is a stronger chance that earnings will recover and improve and that would allow share prices to go up faster than interest rates so stocks could still um, go up no? and there are a lot of stocks right now that provide dividend yields that are higher than even three percent no? and you know i was wondering when i was doing this presentation if other asian markets are cheaper to the point that uh, funds would prefer them over us. But if you look at this table, you will notice that um, almost all ASEAN markets are trading above their 10-year historical average. Um, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and even Singapore. Only Malaysia is trading below its 10-year historical average. The rest, all Asian markets are expensive. And this might be partly due to the fact um, that we are during the early, we are still in the early phases of the recovery and earnings have not yet normalized to pre-pandemic level. So maybe fund managers are still a little bit open to uh, buying stocks and also not to mention interest rates are so low anyway. So uh, you know stocks are still more attractive relative to funds. And as I've said, there is a there is an ongoing rotation into emerging markets. So let's look at the left side chart first. I compare the FTSE ASEAN 40, its performance relative to the S&P 500. So from March to June, you will notice they perform the same way, but from June to October, the performance of ASEAN uh, was worse off compared to the S&P 500 in the US. And in a way, this reflected the uh, COVID-19 reality. Um, ASEAN is a lot more vulnerable to COVID-19 because we don't have a lot of those tech issues that would benefit from people staying at home. No, We are more uh, geared towards your mga cyclicals, your property companies, your banks, no? uh, which explains the underperformance. But then what happened? Uh, in November, there, there was this, uh, there were news that these uh, uh, you know, um, manufacturer or the pharmaceuticals came out with favorable phase three results of their vaccine tests. And uh, well, of course, emerging markets are expected to benefit the most coming from a much lower base compared to the US, which explains the outperformance starting in um, November and the growing preference for um, Asian emerging market stocks. So you can see here that uh, starting November, uh, funds flowing into Asian emerging market ETFs have actually uh, picked up substantially. Okay. And you may be wonder why are uh, investors now favoring emerging markets? Well, in Asia, at least, first, there is a better management of COVID 19 cases compared to say the developed market. So we, we know right now in the US and in Europe, um, they're actually doing lockdowns again. Um, in Asia, well, you know, the number of COVID-19 cases are picking up, but not to the point that they are uh, replicating the, you know, um, the spreads that we are seeing in developed markets. Secondly, um, Cyclical companies stand to benefit more from the rollout of vaccines, as discussed earlier. And finally, a lot of Asian countries are dependent on commodity exports, and commodity prices are actually picking up a lot. Did you know that a lot of commodity prices are now trading above their end 2019 level and even above their pre pandemic level? So, you know, Asian countries should benefit given that uh, they, a lot of Asian countries are commodity exporters. And aside from that, the dollar is weakening because of the aggressive fiscal stimulus programs of program of the government and the very low interest rates of the Fed. So, yes, the peso is strong, but what's helping that also is the weak dollar. And if the dollar is weak and I'm a foreign fund manager, 
you know, I'm looking for, you know, other places where I can invest so that the returns of my funds will improve. Okay. So for the stock picks, instead of um, talking about the different sectors, I thought of sharing with you various themes which I think will prevail in 2021 and uh, what stocks you can buy to capitalize on these themes. So the first theme that I think will uh, continue in 2021 is the search for yields because interest rates are so low. For example, time deposit rates right now are uh, below 1%. You'd actually be so happy already if you get a, a time deposit rate of 1%, which is really ridiculous if you think about it. Um, I remember uh, many years ago when I started working, my dad advised me to save enough money so that you know I can live off of interest because before you could actually uh, earn more than 10% on time deposit, but right now that does not exist. Anyway, um, as far as these stock picks are concerned, these uh, telcos, for example, still provide dividend yields of around 5%, 5.4. And the earnings growth prospect um, is very attractive for these companies as there is um, growing demand for data. And as the economy recovers, their mobile phone business should also see more top ups because mobility increases. And aside from that, you have capital appreciation potential. Okay, that's the reason why we like the telcos. So even if you wait a little bit, at least you are going to earn attractive dividend yields. And another thing that's attractive for PLDT, for example, you see a lot of insider buying on the stock. So, you know, that, that uh, kind of um, raises confidence in the issue. And for Globe, they recently announced that um, they found a new investor for Gcash. Um, I think um, Gcash is now valued at around um, a billion uh, US dollars. So eventually, you know, they could unlock the value of Gcash uh, or Mint by doing an IPO. And this would definitely boost the valuation of Globe. Now, uh, right now, with this target prices of PLDT and Globe, we have not yet valued their fintech company. So Globe has uh, Gcash and PLDT has Paymaya. So we are very excited about the long-term prospects of uh, PLDT and Globe. Now, Airit, the recently listed REIT company of Ayala Land, um, is uh, providing a dividend yield of 5.6%. And um, well, uh, this is based on a dividend per share, projected dividend per share of around 1 peso 76 centavos this year, 2021. And it could continue to increase next year because the office properties that are being, that are part of AREIT are projected to have um, an escalation rate on their um, tenants. And also the company said that they will continue to inject more assets inside. Okay. So the next theme um, that we expect for 2021, um, we feel that there, although the market is expensive, there are still some cyclical companies that are still trading at reasonable valuations. And we feel that fund managers will look at them next and they have room to catch up with the rest of the market. And the stocks that we like are predominantly the banks. Um, and we focus on the bigger ones like BDO and Metro Bank. And um, the other companies that we think are very interesting that are part of the index are GP Capital and MPI. Um, so I'd like you all to focus here on the valuation matrices. So for the banks, we usually look at them based on price to book value. Okay. And for BDO, the stock is trading at 1.2 times price to book value. Um, in the past, it traded at an average around one and a half times price to book value. For Metro Bank, it's really so cheap. It's trading below book value. So if a bank is trading below book value, it assumes that your non-performing loans are so high to the point that you will uh, book substantial losses. In other words, mauubos yung capital mo, which I don't think is the case right now. Because in fact, Metro Bank is one of the most conservative banks out there with a 
provisions that are more than a one hundred more than one hundred percent above its non-performing loans. So that even if NPLs continue to go up, which is expected to happen this year, they have more than enough buffer already. So I don't expect them to suffer substantial losses, um, especially now that the economy is recovering. So most likely, uh, the potential peak of the NPLs, um, you know, will be will happen sooner rather than later, and will be much less than what we saw during the times of the Asian financial crisis. And then uh, these are other stocks that are very cheap, GP Capital, um, which also has Toyota inside. So demand for cars, we think, should also recover um, going forward. And um, MPI, which is in, into so um, and the uh, power. So demand for power is actually um, around one digit down compared to pre-pandemic level. Uh, pandemic level. So if you think about it, um, you should actually be paying a much better valuation for MPI because of its focus on these more defensive businesses that are less affected by the pandemic. Uh, but it's really very cheap, as you can see, just trading at eight times PE and uh, Point cap in MPI, they are way below the historical average. And then another theme that we expect to uh, continue or to take place this uh, 2021 is property companies unlocking the value of their assets through deep. And our favorite for this theme is Mega World. Um, the reason why we like Mega World is because around 40% of its net asset value comes from its office properties. And Megaworld actually has a very attractive portfolio of office properties that are, uh, that have, uh, most of them have a lot of PESA benefits. Um, if you have PESA benefits, that just means that you are attractive to BPOs. And we know that one of the surprises for 2020 is that demand for offices from BPOs remain very resilient. Okay. And the good news is Megaworld has a lot of those uh, properties with PESA accreditation. And um, aside from that, it has these offices in attractive locations, which are desirable for BPOs. So it has offices in BGC. It has offices also um, the Bay Area and the different um, live, work, play areas that it has. Um, and finally, you know, if you look at the valuations, it's trading below book value. So clearly when it does a read, it will be valuing these reads at uh, much higher than book value. So book value assumes that, you know, your asset is worth less than the time you bought it and the amount you spent when you built the building, which I think is impossible given how high prices have gone up no? and how high rental rates have increased. So. Uh, you know, a lot of value will be unlocked by the uh, sale of office, office assets to these. And finally, the rise of mass retail investors. Well, we don't have any stock picks for this, but what it means is, you know, you have a lot of retail investors coming into the market. So potentially, we may see more volatility um, in stocks, and there could be some stocks which may go up substantially in terms of valuation, exceeding very much... Uh, how much they are valued based on fundamentals. So we saw that happen in 2020 and we may see that continuing in 2021. So that's our prognosis. So these are, so the next slide, well, these are some other stocks that we think are, are okay, but you know, compared to the first slide, they might not be the priorities because a lot of them have a little bit imperfect stories. They might not be also or um, for example, for the cyclical companies playing catch up, these would be your smaller cap issues. So, for example, when the foreign investors start coming into the market, they would prioritize the bigger capitalized companies. But I'm not saying these companies are bad, they are okay. In fact, if you look at them, some of them are actually providing you very good um, dividend yields. So, if you have a long, 
longer term investment time horizon, you may actually also look into this um, um, list of stocks. And you may also want to, if you have them, you may consider keeping them in your portfolio. And eventually, um, you know, I'm quite confident that their share prices should also go up no? Okay, what are the risks to our outlook? First is challenges in the vaccination process. Second is rising inflation. Is, and third is um, tightening by global central banks and the BSP. Okay, so as far as the vaccination process is concerned, of course, there is a risk that Filipinos might, uh, might avoid getting vaccinated. So the government can bring in the vaccines, but you know, Filipinos might not sign up to get vaccinated. You know, the funny thing is when they, when the SWS did the survey in September, you can see that 56% of the respondents said that they're willing to get the vaccines. But when the, when Pulse Asia did the survey in November um, to December and Okta Research in the middle of December, the number went down. So let's see if uh, it's really this low or if it's high, you know, we will find out. And then um, food and oil prices are actually going up, um, not only in the Philippines, it's a global phenomenon. And uh, of course, this is pushing up inflation. Inflation is actually a concern not only in the Philippines, but also in other countries. So this is the UN Food and Agriculture World Food Price Index. And as you can see, it has gone up substantially. And uh, prices of uh, oils like palm oil, coconut oil, and cereals such as wheat have actually gone up globally. And then crude oil prices, as you can see, after falling sharply in March, are now back to uh, almost back to end 2019 levels. Okay, so, you know, aside from that, of course, you have your other commodity prices going up. And this is raising some inflation concerns. And I think um, the one of the issues when it comes to higher inflation is, of course, the interest rates or bond rates. And in the U.S., you actually have the 10-year bond rate going up the 1% level after staying below 1% in the whole of 2020. Um, you know, this is a reflection of the higher inflation concern. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons why we have to monitor inflation is the potential increase in longer term bond rates and the implications on the lending rate. And uh, earlier on, we talked about, um, you know, uh, there being no alternative to stocks because bonds, bond rates are so low. Uh, it will discourage people from placing money in bonds. But if bond rates go up, then that trade no longer exists. Right? Okay, but you know, um, that said, I think, you know, we should monitor inflation and interest rates, but at this point, I'm not that concerned. I don't expect central banks, including the BSP, to tighten um, our monetary policy for the following reasons. First, as I've said, the unemployment rate remains very high. Capacity utilization rate is still very low, and this is not only true in the Philippines, but around the world. So because of that, central banks are a little bit hesitant about raising rates because if you raise rates, then uh, you will not be helping uh, economic growth. No. Next is um, in the Philippines, at least uh, local rice prices remain stable. So, um, you know, last year, despite the typhoons, uh, local production of palay actually increased by 2%. And uh, this year, it's projected to increase by around 6% because the government is giving the farmers free, um, free seeds and they're lending them money. In fact, we will be importing less rice this year. So I checked the prices of local rice and through 2020, it was actually stable, notwithstanding the shoot up in prices around April and May because uh, Vietnam and Thailand decided to stop exporting rice but we were not affected because we actually had more production which is a good thing and um, as far as um, inflation expectations are concerned in the philippines there still is no change 
uh, consumers and businesses who were surveyed during the consumer confidence and business confidence survey said that they expect prices to be a little bit higher this 2021 but not to the point of reaching 4%, which is the threshold of the PSP. And finally, uh, global central banks or more of developed market central banks that are engaged in bond buyback programs um, maintain committed to buying bonds to control longer term interest rates. Okay, so in summary, the 2021 economic outlook of the Philippines is not very attractive given the poor outlook for both consumer and business spending and delays in the passage of the tax cuts. However, we think the market can still go up on hopes that the availability of COVID-19 vaccines will help economic conditions normalize faster. Um, valuations of stocks are still not expensive relative um, to bond rates. And finally, the ongoing rotation into emerging markets um, should benefit countries like the Philippines you know, because we stand to benefit or countries in emerging markets stand to benefit the most from availability of vaccines, rising commodity prices and the weak dollar. So investors can participate in the markets by buying dividend plays such as Globe, PLDT and ARI or by buying companies that are still cheap that will catch up with the rest, such as Metrobank, BBO, GP Cap, and MTI, and some REIT plays or companies that may unlock value to REIT, such as Megaworld. And risk to the stock market, strong performance into challenges in the rollout of vaccines, rising inflation, and tighter monetary policy. So before I end, um, I'd like to share with you this quote from Stanley Drucken Miller. He's one of the um, most successful fund managers or hedge fund managers in the US. And this is what he said as far as the market is concerned. Earnings don't move the overall, the overall market. It's the Federal Reserve Board, focus on the central banks and focus on the movement of liquidity. Most people in the market are looking for earnings and conventional measure. It's liquidity that moves markets. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, April. Thank you. So I think, uh, wait, I hope you guys were taking down notes because I did, I did some. And um, it looks like April is really not optimistic about the economy. Business, is, business confidence is low and the market is not cheap. No? However, there is, there is hope for the vaccine that will bring confidence because about we are projecting about 70 million people to be vaccinated. And I, I, like, I like the quote of uh, Duncan Miller. It is actually liquidity that is really going to push the market. And liquidity will really come from what? Low interest rates. Uh, people will just have to buy stocks because they're not going to earn much on bonds. And uh, the possibility of foreign inflows could drive the market up. And... Uh, for you guys to participate in this recovery, note the themes she mentioned, no? her stock picks. Look at the high dividend paying stocks like the telcos, AVI. Look at the cyclicals, meaning companies that will grow with the economy like the conglomerates and the banks. And the property, um, look at the REIT. REIT. There, 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 is, there, is, there are REIT plays that's coming this year. So these are your opportunities to, to uh, participate in this market. So thank you for that, April. Thank you for those insights.